Hi, this is Job Aguas, and welcome to my lectures in Philosophical Anthropology. And for this topic, for this discussion, I will be talking about man as an existential subject. So I will be uh, focusing on, or I will be dividing my discussion onto several parts. First, I will be talking about the human situation, and then I will be discussing uh, man as an embodied subjectivity. Uh, in that aspect, uh, in that part, I will be focusing on the philosophy of Gabriel Marcel. Then the next will be man as an acting subject. And I will be focusing more on the philosophy of Carol Pitiwa. And then the next will be man as freedom or freedom and um, self-determination. And I will be focusing on the ideas of Carol Pitiwa and Jean Paul Sartre and brief discussion on uh, libertarianism and uh, determinism. And then the last part will be a discussion on a man as a finite subject, as a temporal subject, man as a being and towards death. And I will be focusing on two philosophers, uh, Martin Heidegger and Karl Jaspers. So um, you can see my, my lecture notes. So you can just follow the discussion and uh, hopefully uh, <clears throat> we can have a, a meaningful discussion on this topic, man as existential subject. So you can see there some of the required readings from Sard, Marcel, Vitiwa, and Heidegger. Okay. So let me start with the notion of subject. Uh, the term subject refers to anything that exists in itself and by itself. And uh, in the sense, we can say that man is a subject because he exists by himself and in himself. However, in the Greek philosophy, as well as in uh, medieval philosophy, uh, Aristotle, Plato, and St. Thomas and the other uh, and up, up to a certain degree, the, the modern thinkers, they consider subject to be uh, applicable to anything that has a specific nature, especially Aristotle and Plato. For them, subject is something that has a specific nature. Like, for example, a tree, a horse, um, a stone, man, particular kind of animal, and so, and so on. So it has a specific nature horse, for example, man, for example, stone, for example, they have a specific nature. But for the existentialist, uh, the existentialist uh, philosophers, they insist that existence can only be ascribed to man or the human person because they define existence in terms of a subject who is able to stand out of itself and look into itself. Meaning a subject is somebody who has interiority, who has a self and interiority or selfhood does not apply to other objects like the animals or an inanimate object or a physical object. It only applies to man and therefore it cannot be applied to those um, non-human, non-personal uh, objects. Now, this ability to stand out, you know, this ability to stand out and have a relation with himself is is possible only in a subject who has consciousness and consciousness is again a part of the interiority of man okay consciousness enables man to look into itself you know his interiority and inner self and therefore man because is the only being who has consciousness, then he is the only being who can stand out, stand out and look into itself. Okay? A related concept in the existentialist is that being a subject means having interiority or an inner self as compared to an object which does not have any interiority or consciousness. So as we have said, the physical object like a rock, um, does not have any consciousness or interiority. It cannot have a relationship 
or it cannot look into itself. Okay, so man has consciousness, not just that he has consciousness, he is not just conscious or aware of the objects that are outside of himself, he is in fact aware of himself, he has self consciousness. Now, as an extensive subject, man is not just a member or part of the species or just a logical construction or idea. Man is a concrete human individual. He's fully alive, he exists in the world, he acts and makes his own decisions, he determines his action, he's capable of loving, he's capable of hating, and so on and so forth. So what concretizes man's existence is his body. This is human body. And therefore, we say that a man or the human person is an embodied subject. He is a subject because he has interiority, he has, you know, his inner thoughts, his feelings, etc., etc. But he also expresses those inner thoughts, those aspirations, those wishes, the inner self through the body. He embodies, okay? he makes incarnate his subjectivity. But man is not just a concrete and embodied subject. He is a being or subject that exists in the world. He is a being in the world. Okay, so he associates, he connects with the world, he relates with the world. He engages and relates with the objects in the external world. But while man expresses his subjectivity through the body, his expressions are in the form of human actions. Actions that are conscious and self-determined. <clears throat> so he's also a person in act, an acting subject. And it is through his actions that he is able to express his subjectivity. So it is through man's body that man body, uh, incarnates his subjectivity, but there should be a, a, an accompanying action in order to, exterior, to exteriorize, express oneself. And we express ourselves through our actions. So there is a connection between being embodied and acting. So <clears throat> now, Another very important concept is that when he acts, he expresses not only his subjectivity, but also his freedom. Actions are self-determined, and therefore my actions are freely determined. Okay, so human actions are conscious and self-determined actions, and the person creates his own personality and essence out of this freedom. So as human persons, our individual nature is not fixed like the objects, like the rock, like horse, etc. We have the capacity to choose to determine, determine our action and to determine our own self. In this sense, we are self-determined and free. We can always choose within the limit of our finitude how we are going to act, how we are going to live, and how we are going to be all right now let's go now to the first major part of this discussion and that is the human situation and being or man as being in the world first the notion of the human situation no person exists or lives in a vacuum we always find ourselves existing living or going about our lives in concrete situation. Like for example, what I'm doing now is part of a concrete situation. And part of that situation is me being a teacher. And of course, part of the situation is that we are in an enhanced community quarantine. And therefore I cannot give uh, you know, a classroom discussion or a face-to-face -face discussion with you. And therefore uh, I have to do this online or video record my my lecture okay so there are factors and conditions this 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 situation is composed of the facts and conditions that shape and condition our life all right so uh there is the environment the institutions the society the people our own personal circumstances like this one that influence our life and therefore 
uh, since the human person is an actual and specific individual subject, his existence and life is always within a specific situation. Okay, the, this our situation defines to some extent who to some extent who we are. So, as actual human persons, we find ourselves in concrete human situation. Okay, and these human situations consist of the different conditions and features, circumstances that we find ourselves in. Every moment of our existence, we always find ourselves in a human situation. So the human situation is not just a particular condition or environment, like for example, I'm sitting here in front of my laptop. No? Uh, it's not just one instance of our daily life, okay? So uh, our human situation is not just defined by one specific, you know, moment in our history, like, for example, that we are in an enhanced quarantine, no? So the human situation is the general circumstances or features that define our individual existence. Now, according to the existentialist philosophers like Martin Heidegger, our human situation is characterized by two sets of features, namely facticity and transcendence or possibility. Facticity refers to those features or conditions that are given to us and fixed from without, meaning there are those that are beyond our control. Most likely, we are just born into it or with it. Take, for example, our gender or the color of our skin or our family our parents, our physical features, the physical and social environment we find ourselves when we were born. These are parts of facticity. They are fixed from the outside. We are not the ones who determine them. Okay. And of course, so to some extent, they are unchangeable. They are, they are permanent. Okay. Of course, uh, nowadays, some of those that I mentioned can now be changed because of technology, the advancement in science, and so on and so forth. The second is transcendence or possibility. This refers to the features or conditions of our existence, which have been decided and created by us. So they are within our, you know, within our control. We were the ones who determined them, who created them, put them into place, put them into existence. Okay. So we can either change them or go beyond them or just ignore them, okay? So these are our thoughts, our actions, our decisions and choices, our dreams, our attitudes, you know? These are features that we can transcend or develop further, okay? Because they originate from us. However, it's not always easy to determine or ascertain which of the features of our existence belong to facticity or transcendence, okay? And we cannot always make a fine, you know, a strict demarcation between the two. And the specialist thinkers do not try to resolve this because this is one character, again, of human existence. We cannot tell how much of what we see or have, you know, are created by our by us by our own prejudice or they are independent from us and they were created uh by other people for us or we are already born with it but there are certainly some features that truly belong certainly belong to say facticity like for example that we are thrown into this world we were never asked where if we're going to be you know uh, we were never consulted with whether, whether we want to be born or not, or whether we're going to be born to this parent or this family or not. All right. So, um, our attitude towards all our own facticity towards those that we cannot change is part of our transcendence or possibility because we can either accept the fact that we are born into this, you know, uh, into this kind of world or situation that we are in. It's not our choice that we are put into an enhanced community quarantine, but our attitude towards it 
is un, is within our control. And therefore, you know, we can change our attitude towards it. So we can regard our facticity as hindrance or opportunity. This enhanced uh, community quarantine can either be considered as a hindrance to whatever we want to do, or it can be an opportunity to do something else. Right? So these are for our development in order for us to have meaningful existence. You know, we can, we, can, we can just complain and complain about the quarantine or make the most of the time we have at home. Okay? I never imagined that I'm going to, I'm going to make a par, uh, an online, online discussion about this, but this is an opportunity to make an online presentation. So while we can no longer change our some of the things that are permanent, okay, like the race, our physical pleasures, physical. Uh, so the human person as a being in the world. This idea of being in the world is uh, introduced by the German philosopher Martin Heidegger. But the question is, what does world mean here? Term world could have several meanings. One, it could be physical space or the totality of the physical objects in the world. But for Heidegger, the world is not just a space or the totality of the objects in this space. <clears throat> the world includes the interconnection of these objects and our relations with these objects, whether we use them or consume them or manipulate them. Of course, when you look at the physical world, we can see the different physical objects. There are objects that are not within our reach, meaning, well, they are just there, but they are not part of our world. There are some objects that we do not use. There are some objects that you know, we don't deal with. But there are certainly objects that we use and we deal with. And they become part of our world. Because we can establish relation or connection with them. We have dealings with them. So they belong to our world. Like, for example, this laptop belongs to my world because I have dealings with it. You, as a teacher, you, my students, are parts of my world because I have dealings, relations with you. Right? So when we say world, it means the world that is nearest to us. Our environment, and this would consist of those things that are significant to us, those things that we relate with, those things that we have dealings with. But our world is not only composed of physical objects. It is also composed of people whom we relate and communicate with. Our families, our friends, our associates, our acquaintances, the members of our, you know, our neighborhood, as a teacher, you, my students. As human individuals, we have our own respective world. And the people and objects in this world have significance to us. So, for example, as students, we have our own world. You as students, you have your own world. And this world will consist of people you associate with, like your teachers, your classmates, the office staff, the school administrators. And, of course, the things that are important to you as students, like your books, Okay, your learning and study materials, the places you go to, like the classroom, the library, the canteen, or whatever place you go to as students. So to be in the world, therefore, it's not just to be contained in a particular space, in a particular, you know, place. It's not to be located in one particular area of the classroom, for example, or of the, of the library. To be in the world is to have dealings or connections with the objects and relations and people in the world we find ourselves in. So, our dealings with the objects in the world is different from our relations with people in the world. These objects are used, they are manipulated. We consume them, we categorize them, right? We objectify them. They are, according to Heidegger, either ready at hand, which means they are ready to be used as tools, as instruments, you know, as gadgets, like our cell phones, like our tablets, you know, like our laptop, or they are present at hand, which means they are 
always there available to us. Okay? Meaning they're always there. You can we can always use our cell phone, of course, if they're not lost. No? So a ball pen is ready at hand. It's ready to be used for writing. Okay? Our gadgets, they're always present at hand because they're always available to us. People, on the other hand, are fellow human persons. And therefore, we do not use or manipulate them. They are not objects. They are subjects. They are not tools that we are that we use, or we all we who we always expect to be available to us. Our orientation with them is one of personal relation. So we establish a personal intersubjective relation with them. We relate with our classmates. We relate with our teachers. Uh, we relate with the school personnel, with officials, with our friends, with our family, etc., etc. Hence, our being in the world is defined by two orientations or relations. First, there is the relation with the things and objects. And second, there is the relation with our fellow human beings. Although sometimes we can or we do consider our the people around us as objects. We also objectify them. I'm going to pause for a break and I will continue in the next part for the second presentation. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you have learned a lesson or two from this discussion. Um, stay safe and God bless.